Imagine if you could deploy your .NET applications to the cloud without having to manage or provision any infrastructure. Well, you don't have to imagine this at all because you can do this with AWS Lambda. Before we dive into AWS Lambda, I want to say a huge thank you to AWS for sponsoring this video and helping me bring AWS closer to the .NET community. Let's start by explaining what AWS Lambda is. It's a compute service that you can use to build applications without provisioning or managing servers. In the practical part of this video, we're going to build a .NET 8 minimal API and deploy it using AWS Lambda as a serverless function. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and let's first discuss how we can use AWS Lambda to build web applications. AWS Lambda is a trigger-based compute service meaning that something has to happen before the Lambda function is going to execute. A very common example would be somebody taking a photo using your application, and then you're going to upload that photo to an Amazon S3 bucket. This is going to be the storage mechanism for the photos inside of your application, but the very cool part is that you can configure an AWS Lambda function that's going to trigger whenever you upload a file or a photo to an Amazon S3 bucket. So let's say we uploaded a photo to S3, this is going to trigger a Lambda function that's going to run some compute on the photo itself. A very common use case is resizing the photo to make it fit into the various application formats that you want to support. For example, you could have different formats or sizes of the image for a web application, a mobile, or a tablet. The Lambda function is going to run in the background when the upload to S3 triggers it, and is going to resize the images and then probably store them also inside of an S3 bucket. And then you'll be able to use them inside of your application. Another common use case for AWS Lambdas is using them as request and response services. So you would have your application send a request. In this case, it's going to be routed to an Amazon API gateway, which is going to trigger the respective AWS Lambda function. The function itself can reach out to a database, for example, Amazon DynamoDB, and then it's going to return a response through the gateway to the application that requested this information. Let's also discuss some of the main benefits of AWS Lambda before we dive into our .NET application. And the first thing is that you don't need to manage any servers. All of this is abstracted from you behind the AWS Lambda service. AWS Lambda also gives you automatic scaling, which is useful if you have an increase in application traffic. Lambda will be able to handle the increased traffic and your application should continue to function smoothly. Another advantage is that AWS Lambda is relatively cheap to run. On the AWS free tier, you get 1 million requests for free every month. The pricing model is pay as you go, so you will only be charged for the compute resources that your AWS Lambda consumes. And now let's see how we can use AWS Lambda inside of a .NET 8 application. I don't want this to be just another hello world example using AWS Lambda, even though we have an endpoint returning hello world, what we are actually going to deploy is a URL shortener that has only two endpoints. So this is a very minimalistic implementation. We have a post endpoint that's going to take in a long URL and shorten it. And let me walk you through what's going on here. So we're first going to try to validate the incoming URL. If it's valid, we will proceed to generate a unique code for the long URL. So this is going to be our shortened version. We have to store this inside of a database. So after we complete this, we can return the shortened URL to the caller. We also have a get endpoint that's going to perform a redirect based on the URL code. So we will fetch the shortened URL from the database, and then we're going to perform a redirect to the long URL. So this is what we're going to deploy to AWS Lambda. And as you can see, these are just minimal API endpoints. And this is an awesome feature of AWS Lambda that's made available through a NuGet package that we are going to install. But first, let me quickly show you how this works. So in the background, I'm running this through a Docker Compose setup. We have our API and a Postgres database where I'm going to store the shortened URLs. So let me run the application. With the application running in the background, I'm going to send a post request to shorten this URL to some article on my website. This one specifically is about vertical slice architecture. So let's send a request. And then this is going to shorten this long URL into this URL code that you can see here. And this is actually going to give us the full URI where we can navigate to and we are going to be redirected to the long URL that you can see here. I'm going to open up the Swagger UI and I'm going to paste in the value that's pointing to the shortened URL. And if I navigate here, 
you will see that I'm going to be redirected to the long URL, which is the respective article about vertical slice architecture on my website. So our URL shortener is working as expected. And now let's actually introduce a proper database. You can see that we are connecting to a Postgres database. However, the database itself is running inside of our Docker Compose setup, but we can't use this from our AWS Lambda when we deploy this to the AWS cloud. So let's provision a Postgres instance that we can actually use from our application. I'm going to open up the AWS console and I want to create an RDS instance, which is Amazon's relational database service. And you can use RDS to provision a cloud instance of some of the popular relational databases. I already have a Postgres database configured, which I'm going to be using from my application, but I want to show you how you can set up a database yourself. So I'm going to click on create database and I recommend going through the standard create process because you have more control. I'm going to be using Postgres, but you can also use SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, and the other database providers that you have. Let's continue with our Postgres setup. I'm going to leave the default Postgres engine, and I'm going to choose the free tier template because I'm using this just for development. Then I'm going to configure my database settings where you need to set up a unique name for your database. I'm going to leave the default values. Then you will have an option to configure your database credentials. You can set up some custom credentials. Here is the master username and you can specify your database password. I'm going to leave all of this empty. Here you can choose your instance size. You can use a T3 micro instance or a T4 micro instance. I'm just going to leave the smallest one. By default, you will have 20 gigabytes of storage and then you can configure some other options. These are related to the virtual private cloud where your database is going to be running. What I want to enable here is public access so that I can connect to my database from my local machine and use it for testing. So I'm going to check yes for this and I'm going to leave everything else with the default values and we can go ahead and create our database. You can decide to leave monitoring on or you can turn it off and below you're going to get the estimate or how much this is going to cost you every month. However, this is also part of the free tier. So if you have access to the Amazon RDS free tier, you can use this for free for 12 months. So now you would click create database and this will provision a Postgres instance. I'm going to stop here and I will go back to the database instance that I've already provisioned, which is using the same setup that I just showed you. And I want to show you just one important bit that you will need to set up if you want to connect to your database from localhost. I'm going to navigate to the default security group. And if I open up the security group details, you can see I configured an additional inbound rule that's going to allow me to connect to my RDS instance on this port 5432 from my local address. You can add this by saying edit inbound rules. You can say add rule. You can choose all traffic, for example, and for the source, you can choose my IP. And when you introduce this rule, you will be able to connect to the RDS instance from your local machine. Now I'm going to go back to my RDS database. In here, we're going to need a few more things. So the important one is going to be the RDS endpoint, which is the host that we can use to connect to our RDS instance. So I'm going to copy this value and head over into my application. We want to use this as part of our connection string. So here you can see I have a connection string to the Postgres instance running inside of a container. However, I want to connect to my RDS instance. So I'm going to comment this out temporarily because I won't be needing it. And I'm going to add the connection string for my RDS instance running in AWS. And you can see that the host is the value that I copied from the RDS instance. The port is 5432. I'm using the URL shortener database and I'm specifying my username and password that I configured when creating my RDS instance. So now our application is going to connect to a Postgres database running inside of the AWS cloud. Let's quickly check if this is working. If I send a post request to the shortened endpoint, you can see that we get back a response. Remember that we are using our RDS database. And if I use this shortened URL and navigate to this address, you will see that I'm redirected to the correct long URL. So our URL shortener is working with an RDS database running inside of the cloud. And the only thing that's remaining is to deploy this with an AWS Lambda. The AWS team has actually made this incredibly simple. All we have to do is add a NuGet package. So let me look for AWS hosting and I'm going to install Amazon Lambda ASP.NET Core Server hosting. Let's go ahead and add the latest version. And then all we have to do to make this work as an AWS Lambda is say builder services add AWS Lambda hosting. We also have to specify an enum value, which is the Lambda event source. 
and I'm going to choose HTTP API here because I'm deploying a minimal API application. If you are running AWS Explorer, you can go ahead and use it to deploy your AWS Lambda. You could also do this from the project itself. You can right click and then use publish to AWS, but I want to show you how we can achieve this through the CLI. You can access the CLI through the .NET Lambda command. And if you don't have this installed, you can install it as a global tool by saying .NET tool install and then G for global, and you will specify Amazon Lambda tools. So I already have this installed, so I'm just going to deploy my Lambda function, and I will say .NET Lambda deploy function. This is going to give us a few prompts for how we are going to deploy our Lambda function. So I'm going to specify .NET 8 as the runtime, then this is going to execute a publish command, and it's just going to publish our .NET application, and it's going to zip all of the DLLs into a zip file. Then I need to enter a function name, so I will say URL shortener. This is going to create a Lambda function, and I need to create an IAM role for this function. So I'm going to create a new role, and let's call this URL shortener. Then we need to choose from a list of policies, and let's choose number four, which is the AWS Lambda basic execution role. We have to wait a few moments for this IAM role to propagate to all of the AWS regions, and after this completes, we are able to configure the memory size for our Lambda function. I'm going to specify 256 megabytes. For the timeout, I'm going to be very constrictive here and say five seconds. And then for the handler, you should just enter the name of your assembly because our application is called URL shortener. This is our assembly name. So this is going to be our handler. So after I configure all of this, it's going to deploy my new Lambda function. If I go over to the AWS Explorer and I open up AWS Lambda and click refresh, my new Lambda function should show up. So let's head over to the AWS console and take another look at our new Lambda function. If I navigate to my Lambda functions, my URL shortener Lambda function is deployed as expected. Now, I want to show you a few more things that you want to configure here to be able to use your AWS Lambda. So let's head over to the configuration tab. And the first thing I want to do is to expose a function URL to make this publicly accessible. I won't use any authentication so that anyone can connect to my AWS Lambda and let's click save. And now we are going to get a URL where we can access our AWS Lambda. Another thing you need to do is to configure the connection from my AWS Lambda to the RDS database that's running my Postgres instance. So I'll have to connect this to the RDS database. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to use an existing database and this is the database that I already created. So let's create this connection and this is going to do some work in the background to connect my AWS Lambda to the Postgres instance running inside of RDS. While the function is updating, let me navigate to the function URL. So I'm just going to click the function URL and you can see that we get a hello world response. So our hello world endpoint is working as expected. I'm going to copy the function URL and head over to Postman. Of course, I will have to wait for a few moments for my AWS Lambda to update properly. So after my Lambda function was updated in the background, and the connection to RDS was established, I can send a post request to the API shorten endpoint, specify my long URL, and after this request completes, we will get a fully qualified URL that's going to redirect us to the long URL that we shortened. So I'm going to copy the URL that we get as a response, and then let's navigate to this URL using our Lambda function. So if I hit enter, you will see that we will be redirected to the long URL, which is the article about vertical slice architecture. So you can see how incredibly easy it is to deploy a minimal API application to AWS Lambda. Now I want to show you a few more things. If I go back to the default URL for my Lambda function and I navigate to Swagger, you can see that I won't be able to access this. And this is because we are only enabling Swagger inside of a development environment. So how can we configure this in our Lambda function? If I go back to my AWS Lambda and head over to configuration and then environment variables, I can introduce another environment variable and let's call this the ASP.NET Core environment. I'm going to give it a value of development and then let's hit save. This is going to update our function. And now if I refresh this, it's going to start up our updated Lambda function, and you can see that the Swagger user interface is going to be exposed on the Lambda function. So you can see that all of our endpoints are here. This is also how you would want to pass in your connection string. Instead of specifying it in the application settings when deploying the Lambda function, 
you can omit it from the application settings entirely and configure everything using environment variables which is going to be more secure. And I want to go back to my minimal API application and once again highlight that all of this is made possible with just one line of code. All we did was call the add AWS Lambda hosting method and I specify the Lambda event source as HTTP API. And this allows me to deploy my URL shortener minimal API application as an AWS Lambda. If you are curious how you could build a URL shortener from scratch, then you should check out this video next. Also, you can grab the source code from this video from the pinned comment below. Thanks a lot for watching and until next time, stay awesome.